the idea that people went from being nomadic to being sedentary and having to own a plot of land to survive and then they had to own their animals, their, their tools and then their women, their, the ownership of women and the you know, patriarchal control over female sexuality and then the economical imbalance that ensued. I think is really the source of why we live in a compulsory monogamous society. Welcome back to Open Late. I'm your host, Jessica Spandiari, and today I have with me Dr. Maria Tuin. She is a relationship and compersion expert, as well as the founder of Love Insight, a mindful dating and relationship coaching practice where she helps people of all backgrounds navigate intimate love in a growth oriented mindset including couples, transitioning to non-monogamy, and all other relationship styles. This is going to be, she's just such a good fit. Like we're all in the right place today. Um, A little bit that I want to share with you and what we're going to talk about is that Marie completed her doctoral dissertation, if you can tell I only have a bachelor's degree, um, on conversion in consensual non-monogamous individuals at Cal Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where she currently lives and has been since sharing what she learned through numerous podcasts and publications. And we are so lucky to have her and this wealth of knowledge on conversion, which is a topic that you know I've mentioned a couple of times here in the last year that we've been recording open late. So I'm super excited. Dr. Marie, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Jessica. It's so good to be here. Yay. This is going to be a good one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So glad we found each other. (laughs) Likewise. likewise. Yes. Well, I think I would just love to really dive right in. You know, we talk a lot about non-monogamy on this show, obviously. And for those listening, you've probably heard the term compersion um, from, you know, very high level. It essentially means to delight, or I love to say the word delight, but to find happiness and joy through others, through other people's happiness and joy. And we use that in relationship to partners. So you've all heard me say, like, I really enjoy seeing Pasha, like, kiss another woman if it makes him happy. And people are like, how is that possible? And Dr. Marie is going to explain it. (laughs) um, You know, we chatted really briefly right before you came on. I would love to know, before we get into the research, what inspired you to go down this path? Because it's a very specific, uh, very specific idea, conversion. Mm -hmm. Well, first, I come from a very non-traditional background. My parents decided to have me, to have a child without being married, without living together. It was a very conscious, very intentional relationship for them and family building. So I grew up with this open mind about what relationships and love could look like. And I remember when I was in college, um, that was in Quebec around 2000, I started dating and I remember feeling really perplexed with discovering how mononormative society was. Um, Mononormativity is this idea that monogamy is the only way to be, it's the only way to love, it's the only way to partner. And me wanting to, you know, make out and have dates with people and sometimes a guy would say oh I can't kiss you because I have a girlfriend and it always was a bit confusing to me I was like well what does that have to do with me and you Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's fine it's great that you have a girlfriend but somehow the monogamous paradigm or compulsory monogamy so to speak didn't make sense to me so Mm -hmm. it set me on this path of exploring intentional relationships and non-monogamy when it's done openly and consensually. And later on, when I moved to San Francisco and was going to conferences and I discovered the word compersion, I felt like my brain exploded. I was like, oh, that is the um, kind of the nexus of the paradigm I want to live in. Mm. That is the kind of love I want to give to people. A love that is not about control and possessiveness, but really about generosity and and shared joy, 
share, shared happiness. That, that just made sense. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that there really wasn't much research on that topic. And I went on to, to study it. Wow. Was there any research on it that you found back then? You know, that was about seven years ago when I started my PhD process. And there was maybe like five empirical studies on it. Okay. And it was, you know, like better than nothing. And of course, there was more empirical study being done on consensual non-monogamy in general. But really few people researched compersion. And I think part of that is because it's not in the dictionary. It's considered kind of an underground term. And yeah, it's an urban I dictionary. Also, right, right. Urban dictionary. Thank God for that. <laughs> but I also set out to, you know, email the Merriam-Webster and ask them like, hey, when are you going to put compersion in the dictionary or mononormativity? You know, mm -hmm. heteronormativity is in the dictionary. And so what about monogamy? It's the next frontier yeah. of sexual liberation so they responded they said well it's not used um widely enough yet but i guess maybe one day so okay oh that's good to know that they even responded so we're on mm -hmm. their radar mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm not giving up <laughs> yeah okay oh, because really like language shapes our emotions that's the bottom line when we have words to describe you know emotions that we could feel we're more likely to feel them Absolutely. i think it's important to disseminate the word yeah it's almost like without having language it's it's challenging to facilitate your experience or your process um mm -hmm. because it's really hard to integrate it when you can't speak about it exactly your life. yeah exactly. it's so important um we actually made a dictionary when we first started open late and um, maybe around episode 10 or 12, because that was one of the first things that I was like, I'm, we're saying all these words and people are writing into me that they've never heard this before. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, okay, well, we should put together just like a cute little dictionary. And it only has maybe 12 or 14 words in it. Um, mm -hmm. And we we're getting ready to do a big update and add about 10, 10 or so things. Um, but so I appreciate, you know, just the note on language and and the word in general, because many people have never heard it. And mm -hmm. I think it's important not just for the people who are, are practicing non-monogamy or, or you know, curious about a different type of relationship style, but for all relationships, even the monogamous relationships, to mm -hmm. understand compersion. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So to understand it and to have um, a ready, a ready-made concept, a ready-made word, you know that gives us an alternative that points to the fact that jealousy is not inevitable. It's not the only possible reaction to, you know, situations that can create jealousy. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, you know, like think about jealousy amongst women, how widespread that is and how, you know, like entrepreneurs and people in general, like people are living in a paradigm of competition mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we can break from that and we can cultivate compersion and kind of remedy that sense of separation and competition between human beings it is very significant for everyone, not just people in polyamorous or non-monogamous relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I have so many questions and I have a feeling you're going to answer many of them when we dive into the research. Um, so I think... Let's go there first, because I don't want to start asking questions that might come in out of order. And these are going to be your findings. I have a, a, a strong feeling. So mm -hmm. I guess take us through, first of all, I, I, you know, like I mentioned earlier, just as a joke, you know, I have a bachelor's degree, um, but I don't have a master's. And I certainly haven't even fathomed what it's like to, to get a PhD. Um, so maybe if you can take us through that experience and what sort of the personal journey is as well for people listening, because I think it really lends to understanding then also your findings, like mm -hmm. how are you finding them and mm -hmm. what goes into it? Um, what type of studies are you doing? Are you conducting like your own sort of research? And then, and then we can get to like the juice of what's on the other side. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you for asking that question. Many people don't ask. And I think that is a really big part of 
understanding findings and, and research is like, where does it come from? How is it done? And really, um, getting a PhD is not rocket science, like people might assume. Um, it's to go from being just a consumer of knowledge to being a creator of knowledge. Mm. And how do you do that? You have so many options in terms of what type of research you want to conduct. And in psychology, there's two main categories of research. There's quantitative and there's qualitative. Quantitative is when you take a big sample of people, like hundreds, maybe thousands of people, you ask them to fill in a survey, you ask them very specific questions, and then you do statistics. And that gives you a big picture on a phenomenon, mm. um, but it doesn't give you a close by picture. It doesn't give you a lot of details into like, how people make meaning out of their experiences, etc. What I chose to do is qualitative research, which is a smaller sample of people. I took 17 people and I asked them a lot of questions. Basically, I interviewed them in a very similar way that you're doing to me right now. I sat down with them and I asked them, you know, for about an hour, an hour and a half, what is it for you when you experience compersion? How does it feel? How do you experience it? What are the thoughts? What are the feelings? When do you experience it? When do you not experience it? When do you experience more jealousy? How did you interpret that experience the first time you experienced it? Like, what does it mean for you in your relationships? What do you think it means for social change, et cetera, et cetera? So I asked them a series of questions and they really got into the nitty gritty of their experiences of non-monogamy and compersion. And then out of this data, which is a lot of data, even though it's 17 people, it's a lot of details. Then mm -hmm. I created a theory of what is compersion and what does it take? What, what promotes compersion and what hinders compersion? Mm -hmm. So it's a preliminary theory, but it's really foundational to the field because there's not a lot of research done yet. And Now, in the last few years, since I finished my qualitative research study, there's been a little bit more quantitative studies being done. So we're kind of like painting a picture. We start with not much, not much scientific knowledge on a topic, and then we look at it from different angles to paint the picture. Mm, okay. And then so you can bring in the, the quantitative research into your picture. Mm -hmm. And then does that inform your theory or... Um, or do you, you have your theory and you sort of use things to either support it or to show a different perspective, and then that's how you write your dissertation? So, I mean, the whole dissertation was the theory building from, from that qualitative study. Okay. And what I found are themes. So, mm -hmm. like, I had two research questions. One was, what is compersion? And then I found, you know, that compersion is a Is it okay if I go into the, the research findings yeah, now? I'm ready. Is it a good time? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's fun to talk about method, but everyone wants to know what the findings are. I so the good. first, yeah, the first question, what is compersion, resulted in three themes. One was empathy. So it's an empathetic experience. Mm. It can be a combination of like cognitive empathy, like I can imagine what you feel, and also embodied empathy. I feel what you feel. Mm. And then there's gratitude, gratitude for, you know, your partner um, having another relationship and what that means to you and what that brings to your life and how grateful you are that maybe this other partnership is bringing more to, to your partner, to you, to the relationship. And then the third theme was that it is very fluid and dynamic as a concept. It's not an on or off switch. It is more of a spectrum from jealousy to benevolent neutrality to compersion where you feel happy with somebody else's happiness. Got it. Um, wow, this is beautiful. So I want to backtrack just a little bit because when yeah. you first said it takes empathy, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the thought that popped up for me is like, is everyone capable of having embodied empathy? That is a good question. And I would say 
Um, my research didn't answer that question, and I don't know that every single person in the world is capable of it. I mean, you know, we have sociopaths that mm -hmm. typically we describe as people who don't have embodied empathy. Right. Um, but I think it's rare. That someone and, can experience it. Right, right. Yeah. I think most people are wired with that capacity for embodied empathy, those mirror neurons mm -hmm. that give you the ability to feel what another person is feeling. I mean, as babies, when we look at our caregiver's face and, you know, they smile at us, at us we smile at them, like we, right. we have that really built in. Yeah, that's that's what I believe too, and I, I guess I brought it up because I always listen um, when I'm when I'm interviewing, and I just like love this conversation already through the lens of like what are my listeners going to be asking, mm -hmm. um, and trying to sort of ask those questions in um, yeah, and thinking about like okay, how's someone receiving this? Because a lot of people are like, well, I'm just not capable of that. Um, and I love to, I love that you brought up, it's just how we are wired. We are wired for empathy. At least that's what I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And it's almost like if it's practiced and if we allow it um, in a healthy way for us to be empathetic in these ways, then you can almost strengthen it like a muscle, mm -hmm. I, would, mm -hmm. I would kind of gather. So um, I feel like when people are like, oh, I'm just not capable of compersion, it's like, um, usually you've already decided that you're not going to be able to do it. And that's likely what's in the way of it happening, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a huge factor when we mm -hmm. think something is impossible. Well, I mean, we're probably going to be able to convince ourselves that it is. Yeah. And then, so, of course, mm -hmm. it's about context. You know, like some people might be able to experience compersion in one context with one partner, but not with the other. Yes, true. Because that's like lending i guess itself to the spectrum as you said mm -hmm. yeah so mm -hmm. can you go into that in a little bit was that coming up in your research where people could feel it for one situation but not another yes yes and that was the second research question which i think is like the most practical uh finding in my research or what are the things that promote compersion like what are the contextual factors Mm -hmm. or elements and there was as you said like what you have in your mind what are your beliefs around it what are your um, ideologies do you believe in non-monogamy do you believe that conversion is possible do you um, kind of interpret feelings of jealousy in a frame that makes it still possible to experience conversion or do you feel that or do you believe that if you experience jealousy, that means you can't experience compersion? Because really, you can experience both at the same time. Mm, yes, you absolutely can. That's. I'm so glad you brought that up because, I mean, I, I've always been a believer that you can have two emotions at once. And many people are doing it all the time without realizing it. And to know that it is totally normal to experience some level of jealousy and some level of compersion at the same time. I remember for early on in my relationship with my husband, I would have that a lot. I would be experiencing excitement and like a big turn on at certain things that were happening. And at the same time, there would be a little bit of, you know, edgy feelings like, um, and for me, it was never a big jealous thing. I, I've always been really good. Well, this isn't true. I've learned, I've become really great at naming my emotions and just feeling into the nuances of them. And I realized early on, it's not quite jealousy for me. It was like an inadequacy. So mm -hmm. the feelings of not enoughness, right? Mm -hmm. um, that my own self-esteem that was coming from within, which I just learned from um, uh, Dr. Tara, uh, who I had on the podcast a couple of weeks back, that wasn't high enough. Like my own self-esteem, which I had built and just the knowing of who I am wasn't secure. It wasn't like a jealous thing. And so I think a lot of people will blanket term jealous um, first. And so I think it's cool to explore what's underneath that because maybe it mm. is jealousy, but maybe it's like an abandonment fear. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I would have a lot of what people would call conflicting emotions. And I also mm. think maybe using the term conflicting emotions is maybe a little bit lazy because who, who's to say that they're like opposites, right? Mm. Compersion and 
maybe low um, self-esteem, right, mm-hmm. are not necessarily mm-hmm. different things. They're, they're different, but they're not like opposing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so mm-hmm. the more we can sort of understand that these things just coexist because we're so multifaceted. So to think like we can only just be excited and nothing else is going on is Mm -hmm. wild because we just Mm -hmm. have so much happening in our human experience. Um, So I'm just really happy that you brought that up, that you can certainly be experiencing all of these things at once and um, to get comfortable with those those feelings and ideas like all happening is really the work. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's what most people um, find that they spend a lot of time doing when they enter into non-monogamous containers is like this type of work. Like, okay, I'm feeling all these things and how do I sort of just be with what, what's happening and process it to hopefully allow more space for compersion to Mm -hmm. sort of take over and, and, and be more of our embodied experience because that's a more pleasurable experience and to hold space so eventually the emotions that we might deem uncomfortable dissipate. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's what we work towards. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love I love that. And you know, like the the holding of so many emotions at once and the possibility possibility of compersion. They don't fit the Hollywood model of love and relationships that we grew up on. Yeah. So we first have to of throw away some of those models uh, that are you know shown in the media and decide we're going to create our own roadmap and be intentional and do what we feel is authentic to us mm-hmm. so I think it takes someone who's willing to go and color outside the lines so to speak and have have their mind on board with that process because yeah. it's not going to look like what you might expect Hmm. Interesting. Okay. What else did you find? (laughs) So you just kind of really went there naturally when you pointed to self security and, and the possibility of having like abandonment wounds and stuff, because the next factor that promotes compersion is internal security, like being able to be self-confident and to have good self-care. So, you know, there's the secure attachment uh, factor, which definitely promotes compersion. That it doesn't mean that people who have anxious attachment or avoidant attachment cannot feel compersion, but it's going to be easier if there's a level of self security. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, if you have eaten well and slept well, and if your life is full with wonderful things that you like to do, you're going to feel less of a threat when your partner is engaged romantically with somebody else. So that also will promote compersion. Mm. Interesting. It's almost like set and setting, which we talk a lot Mm -hmm. about in, Mm -hmm. you know, containers with like psychedelic medicines. It's like if all is well and you've created a, a beautiful baseline for yourself, you can have the ability to have a really positive experience. And that's sort of the lens that I just heard this through for compersion. It's like, if the baseline of your relationship is in a really healthy place, um, you're setting yourself up for success, which Mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense because, well, and and you're a coach too. So a lot of times when people um, might, might come to me about wanting to open up, that's my first question is like, where would you put your current relationship, you know, on a scale of one to 10? And this is for people who are coupled. Certainly a lot of people Mm -hmm. who aren't coupled at the moment want to practice, you know, some level of open. And I think that's amazing on both ends. Um, And then the question is still the same. So people are like, well, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, no, how's your relationship with yourself Mm. and with the people that care for you in your life? If you're not coupled, like who are your closest, you know, um, you know, besties or your parents or your brothers and sisters and making sure that you're in that really good feeling place. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that you said slept well, because I'm not great when I haven't slept well, (laughs) but I've gotten that really under control actually this year, which is, which is fun. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. I, well, you just went to two more factors actually. I'm sorry I keep doing this. (laughs) No, no, no. I mean, it's awesome. I feel like we're kind of psychically (laughs) going there together. Mm -hmm. 
like you talked about how good the relationship is to begin with. And that was, you know, factor number three is wow. like security within the relationship that mm -hmm. you're being open in. Because if you feel like you have a solid bond with this person, you are way more likely to experience compersion if they're going to experience pleasure with somebody else. Wow. So it takes a lot of trust and communication and sometimes reassurance strategies, like being able to go to your partner if you are feeling insecure and say like, hey, babe, I really would love some reassurance here, some insecurities coming up. Can you hug me? Can you hold me? Can you tell me how you feel about me? Just to have those strategies and that, that ability to be so comfortable with one another. Yeah. Wow. This is really, this is a great episode for me personally, because I'm like, okay, I'm like checking all the boxes. Of, <laughs> I'm like, we're doing this. We're doing this pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're eight years in. So I, I always make the joke on this show that, you know, people are seeing the product of you know, years of working at this and tweaking it and finding out what works for us. And so everyone's always like, oh, you make it look so easy. And I'm like, yeah, but you're seeing the, <laughs> the end result. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I should have started this podcast a year in. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because a lot of these things, when you hear them, they seem so simple mm -hmm. and they make so much sense. Um why do you think it's that so many of us, like, especially in, I think, Western culture, like, are so far from these sort of basic ideas around, like, how to have a healthy relationship or communication or opening up to the idea of having more love or being more love and just being in a, a more open and less controlling experience? Because um, I have my theories, mm. but I would love to hear what what yours are around mm -hmm. that and how it's almost like when you hear it, it's like, oh, duh. But mm. like, why don't we come to these things on our own? Right, right. Well, I, I think it's so many factors, some of them historical and economical, you know, like the uh, advent of private property and the idea that people went from being nomadic to being sedentary and having to own a plot of land to survive. And then they had to own their animals, their, their tools, and then their women, their, mm -hmm. the ownership of women and the, you know, patriarchal control over female sexuality and then the economical imbalance that ensued. I think is really the source of why we live in a compulsory monogamous society. It's not really because, you know, I think the archetype is women are more jealous than men in hetero settings. And okay, like, I don't think that's true. I think that uh, most people that I talk to, like the woman is the one who gets sexually bored with monogamy first and mm -hmm. wants to open up first. <laughs> and and I think as we are reversing this historical imbalance of power and women are now financially independent, we are seeing a lot more couples opening up. Mm, yes. Yes, yes, yes to all of that. <laughs> I feel that <laughs> I was like, I have my ideas and I imagine that they're the same <laughs> in my head. It's so true. I've I've mentioned this book so many times on this show, but feel like it's honestly a broken record so to everybody mm. listening I apologize but have you read Untrue? No I thought you were gonna say Sex at Dawn. Oh well that was the first thing that I read mm -hmm. um, but no Untrue is a book by Dr. Wednesday Martin mm -hmm. and it's it's essentially um, it's a it's a really long read actually and the, the audiobook is great too I've done both because her voice is really awesome mm -hmm. and it's essentially the history of everything that you just talked about through like the dawn of the plow and like agriculture and how everything that we've sort of been taught and told or or not taught and told about female sexuality is untrue mm -hmm. and how we are in fact a very sexual beings likely even more than men um, and need much more variety and will um, really be not satisfied in long-term monogamous partnerships much more mm -hmm. than men because mm -hmm. of the there's a difference in the way that we're turned on psychologically 
whereas men can have the same meal every night for dinner for 40 years and still get very aroused meal meaning their wives um but women actually really need a lot of novelty Mm -hmm. um and so it's possible to create that in a monogamous relationship for sure and in long-term partnership um but it it takes takes a lot of thinking outside of the box which is a beautiful thing because the box is so limited um Mm -hmm. what we just look at as like the mononormative heteronormative like you know sex that we um are taught or see and there's like so much more so the good news is there's like a lot to do with that information but it's so empowering to um read a book like that and and feel kind of seen and like oh interesting this is why yeah sex at dawn was like scratching the surface and then (laughs) untrue was like really going in and then poly secure was like a whole other um Mm eye-opening are you gonna write a book yeah, 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 yeah. I'm actually um, going to turn my dissertation into a book. It's now the, the book proposal is in peer review. So I started the process and hopefully within, I don't know, a year or two, I don't really know what the timelines are, but it's in my, it's in my medium, medium term plans. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. I will definitely be the first to read it. Oh, thank yeah. you. So what, if any, because I kind of want to take it back to, you said you'll bring in like the quantitative research, right? To sort of support. Mm. Um, did you look into any, and maybe not, I don't know, but my, my initial question, I'm like, this is probably what people are thinking. Did you see differences in relationships and sort of like happiness factor or fulfillment with people who were experiencing more compersion versus less compersion? It seems like it would be, oh yes, of course, but is there research to support that? Yeah, there's at least one study that I found that was done by other people, not by me, but who who did correlate compersion with relationship satisfaction in consensual non-monogamy. So okay. I actually use that as like one of the arguments to say, well, we really need to study compersion more because it is really a predictor of relationship satisfaction for mm-hmm. all these people, which now we know also from quantitative research that there's about four to five people uh, I'm sorry four to five percent of Americans who are currently involved in some form or other of consensual monogamy and there's one out of five 20 percent who have tried it at some point in their life so it's Mm. not negligible it's a lot it's a lot of people it's a growing segment of the population yeah I and I imagine that it, the number is much higher <laughs> because if I'm just like, this is not a research project, but I have so many listeners that are, you know, closeted mm-hmm. in their non-monogamy. I'll just use closeted for mm-hmm. lack of mm-hmm. a better term, but, you know, don't have the safety or security or the privilege to be open about right. being open mm-hmm. um, and have been practicing for 20 years you know some too some we just we just tried it we haven't told anybody and then others like have been in a swinger community for 20 years and they will literally message me from like a finsta like a you know fake instagram account but that they've curated and this is like their Mm -hmm. way of you know at least sharing this part of their lifestyle but that they would never be able to tell anybody or at least Mm -hmm. like that's their belief and that's like what they're living in and so um, I imagine that if people felt safe and um, as things become less and less taboo and more accepted, hopefully we'll get to see what the true numbers are. Um, it's always kind of interesting like that with research too. You know, I think about um, even when I was reading Untrue, it's like uh, Dr. Wednesday kind of talks about this. I think she just said a note of like, and who knows what the actual number is because these are the women that felt like that trusted me enough to tell me the truth about, you know, cheating on their husbands by the droves, like everyone that she was talking to, Mm -hmm. not because they didn't love them too. And it was like very much like, you know, we can go down that whole rabbit hole. (laughs) I really want to be with this. I love this man so much. I just like really want to have sex with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, and men feeling the same way. Obviously it's not one-sided, but if we 
think about the amount of people just in our country that are practicing non-consensual, non-monogamy, right? And mm-hmm. the, well, the blanket term for that is infidelity or cheating. Mm-hmm. Um, and to realize that that is also essentially just, a, it's non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of my friends who are polyamorous are like, it's not non-monogamy. We're not, we're not <laughs> lumping them in with, with us. We're not taking ownership mm-hmm. of this crew of people, which I understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, it's actually all just non-monogamy. We're just uncomfortable mm-hmm. with the idea of it being talked about or being accepted. It's, it's interesting mm-hmm. that we've come to accept the other as norm um, and that's happening so widespread. But so, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, I imagine that the numbers are really interesting to really know. But thank God that we're, you're doing these studies and other people are starting to at least research, you know, like a term like conversion, which lends to so, so much um, and has been practiced for, you know, millennia. Um, we chatted really briefly about this, and I would love for you to share, where does this word come from? Mm, the word compersion really comes, well, I mean, it was, uh, it emerged in a um, intentional community in San Francisco in the 90s. It was really an invented word. But that said, there is a word in Sanskrit that means compersion that's been used by Buddhists for a long, long time. It's mudita, M-U-D-I-T-A, and that means empathic joy. And the Buddhists consider it one of the four qualities of the enlightened person, along with loving kindness, compassion, and equanimity. So the ability to feel joy when somebody else is experiencing joy is said to remedy the illusion of separation between Mm -hmm. people. And it is therefore a very, very deep spiritual concept. It just, you know, hasn't really been used in the context of sexuality because the the mores and the, um, you know, the oppressive societal thinking is so strong that we don't really allow ourselves to think about empathic joy in the context of romance and sex, but it makes a lot of sense to include it and even include it as a spiritual practice. Mm. Yes. Amen to that. There's so much intersection between sex and spirituality. The more I go down this path of, of, you know, finding the compersion everywhere that I can and, um, I would say for people listening, or I would ask, I guess, is there a way to, you know, start practicing this even if you're not in an open relationship within the context of your findings too, like um, maybe with just other relationships that aren't romantic, like bringing an element of compersion to those relationships? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also kind of want to premise – Um, this and maybe I should have said that at the beginning that you know I don't think we should beat ourselves up if we don't experience compersion in all situations in all relationships there's people who sometimes criticize the use of the word by saying like hey I don't really experience compersion and I feel shame about it I feel like I should be experiencing compersion so just to to make sure I fit that in like I don't think we should use that word to to put ourselves down sometimes it might not be accessible in all contexts yeah. um, but that said um, to even just invoke the idea and to have the word is super helpful for doing that to invoke the idea that hey we're not really separate more for you is more for me we do mm-hmm. not live in a zero-sum universe and it is okay to experience all the emotions it's okay to experience envy jealousy and security i'm not less than for that reason and yet is there something in me in addition to everything that i'm already experiencing that could share somebody else's joy that could get something out of this Mm. to i think to to invoke that concept and that possibility is really the number one even if um Let's say I'm feeling competitive with a friend. 
oftentimes I'll realize like, okay, I am not really happy for their success. What's going on here? And I also use that lack of compersion as a flashlight, as a tool to look at, okay, did something happen? You know, like, did, did I get angry along the way? Like, why is it? Or am I just insecure in a specific way that I can look at and then start to heal within mm-hmm. myself to use the lack of compersion, not again, as a tool to beat ourselves up, but as a tool to inquire into the places where love could flow more abundantly. Mm, I love that. That is such a beautiful way to live, that level of self-inquiry. Um, and to know that, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing, like, to not beat yourself up if it's not there. Um, and, and having the awareness that it's not there is such a beautiful first step for, for clearing out, right? It's like, you know, we don't try to just have more love. We look for the places where the love is absent and we mm-hmm. ask why and how we can like allow the love in because there's love all around us. So the moment that you start to hold space for the places that it isn't, it will just naturally bleed in like light. Um, oh, I think that's really beautiful. <laughs> Yay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. This has been so amazing. Um I would love for I would love for you to maybe share a little bit about your work now, right? Because this mm-hmm. was like, okay, your PhD. This was a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. Right. And currently you're practicing and you're working with people um, as a coach. And what does your work look like? Are you working yeah, yeah like do you do you help couples transition, you know, as as it's in your bio, but mm-hmm. um is it yeah, I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I work really with all kinds of people um, of all backgrounds, all relationship styles. I work with couples and individuals. A big chunk of my work is dating coaching. So oftentimes I work with singles who are looking for dates, for partners, for a life partner. So whatever they want, I just help them be really, really intentional in their dating process and get a lot out of it and get a lot of growth out of it. So I call it mindful dating. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I also work with people who are non monogamous um, and want help with strengthening their relationships, creating more room of more fertile terrain for compersion to arise. Um, And, you know, if it's couples work, then sometimes it's about relationship agreement building because that's a really important factor in building solid relationships is to make sure that people are on the same page as they are co-creating their relationships and what what boundaries do they need what desires do they have and Mm -hmm. and you know very very important things like okay like how much do i want to know about your other relationships do i want to meet the people that you're dating like all these questions can can really lead to stronger trust and more again a more fertile terrain for compersion so it's right. really exciting thank you for sharing i know that anyone working with you in your space is going to benefit greatly and i love the mindful dating i've not heard that yet and i've chatted with a couple different you know dating and relationship coaches, but I think bringing that element of true mindfulness to the process not only is going to likely, you know, bring in better better opportunities and matches, but it also has me think about it like you're actually going to enjoy this experience much more and be present to it. So mm-hmm. for sure, it's going to be more successful when you bring mindfulness to it. But inherently, it's going to be a way better experience even in the action of it because that's actually what it's all about. It's never about the end because when you get to the goal, there's just another goal <laughs> behind it or a set of, a set of things that you're working towards. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, enjoying the journey and, and humanizing the process. I think like a lot of people complain that dating has become so dehumanized with dating apps and technology and people always looking for someone better around the corner. And I think it is in our power to rehumanize dating, to bring loving kindness and mindfulness and presence and awareness 
on the apps or off the apps now that we can finally go out and meet people in person. And yeah, yeah there's so many ways to make this process really rich and enjoyable. Mm, thank you. Is there anything that you want to leave us with that we haven't covered or anything on your heart that you want to share with the listeners? Mm. Oh my gosh, there's so much. <laughs> Well, for those who are interested in compersion, I want to invite uh, folks to visit the website I built with all the research I've done and what research has been done by other people about the topic. There's also a blog that talks more about Buddhism and compersion and about some of the mm -hmm. concepts I've mentioned. And it's whatiscompersion.com. And people can just access all these resources there and also inquire about my coaching. If anyone is interested, they can book a 30 minute free introductory session with me completely. Oh, nice. uh, no strings attached just to get to know each other and see if it might be a fit. Great. Thank you for sharing that and for that beautiful offering. We're going to link your website and also your Instagram and all the places people can find you in the show notes. And I hope to have you back and happy book writing. Oh my I gosh, thank you. Say. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you so thank much. Thank you so much, Dr. Marie. It's been yeah. wonderful. Thank you, Jessica. All right, loves. That's been another incredible episode. I just really get to interview the most amazing people. I'm so, so grateful um, that all of you powerhouse men and women and everything in between keep flying into my life through this podcast. Um, definitely check out Dr. Marie's work. We have linked all the information in the show notes. And of course, please, please, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Share it with people you love or you, who you think might find it interesting. Um, follow us on Instagram and TikTok where we do funny, cool, exciting, and sometimes educational things. And <laughs> Don't miss out on our free talk uh, chat group called Open Talks on WhatsApp. Link in the bio to join in on the discussion. I'll see you next week. <laughs>